So let me know as we go through this uh, context, if there's anything that you want me to pause on, uh, feel welcome to interrupt. Uh, I am more than willing and happy to pause and jump around in different uh, windows uh, within this uh, particular chapter. So what we're doing is, is starting out with chapter two, which is the basic user uh, interface uh, UI. And the objective here, or the idea of the user interface are access to particular, I would consider them basic commands. And, and what I'm hoping to do with this particular chapter is establish the differences between the user interface, which would be the browser, the, the, the actual person that's connecting to our app, and then also that handshake with the server. What you'll find in the chapter, however, is it doesn't spend a lot of time on that server side uh, ser uh, server side language, there are just references to it. We'll talk more about the server side in chapter three uh, as we start to uh, create this basic reactivity concept of the user interface and it's updating to the server and then the server responding back at any rate. So the learning objectives for this chapter two, and by the way, uh, there's a numbering sequence error in our current GitHub page. I spent a little bit of time trying to resolve it. Um, I have reason to believe it was from our cohort number one. Uh, and I, I think I know where the entry was made. Um, I tried to delete that and change it, but then it started to break other things. So I just left it as is, but this is actually chapter two. Uh, so the numbering sequence is, is a little off. The learning objectives for this chapter are to learn the basic input and output handshake of Shiny. Now I'm using the definition of handshake as a reference to a TCP IP server client, uh, HTML, HTTP protocol type concept. What we want to keep in the back of our mind with this learning objective is you've got your user's browser and there could be one person, there could be a hundred people, it could be 10,000 people connecting to your server at any one time. On the back end of this subject would be the server side of language. When we generate our server app, sorry, when we generate our Shiny app, there is a selection where it says, do you want a single file, meaning app.r, containing both your UI and server functions, or do you want to keep these separate as a UI.r and a server.r? We will discover in coming chapters that that is a choice at the uh, initial stages of starting your app. Um, and as a former uh, person within this book club and also in the engineering shiny grade production apps, I would recommend doing a two part UI.R and server.R handshake uh, from the onset of development. And I can reflect on why that's important later. The second bullet we have here is comprehend the UI elements to allow interaction. There are a multitude of different methods or different ways in which we can interact between the browser and the, and the server itself. And the respect to these various arguments or options in our script allows us a more fluid uh, interaction from our user. Okay. The third one, uh, third bullet is construct server receivers for uh, of these UI elements. And what the server receiver language is uh, is uh, pointing at is those server catch points. So we have a placeholder in our UI. There is a complementary server function that would be receiving those uh, calls and managing them from the server's perspective. Okay, moving on. To start out the topic, I wanted to specify or delineate between your user interface, which is your front end. If you ever read a lot of web development language, you will always hear the words front end and back end. The front end will always be the browser's side of language. The back end is going to be your server side. And we've got different methods of web development that we can, we can interact with these calls. Um, you'll hear a lot of JavaScript, you'll hear a lot of uh, Angular and Node.js and, and other uh, Pythonic ways or, or shiny ways of interacting with these two services. But the point being, the picture I want the, the staff or the team to uh, paint in their head is that we have this separation between am I working on the front end of my app or the or the uh, back end server side of my app. There is a, uh, a huge quantity of additional extensions that you can exercise within the shiny service uh, to generate your 
user interface. And we've got a link to a, uh, it's, it's a awesome shiny extensions. Um, I only briefly went to this website and reviewed quickly uh, what they were discussing, but you can look at things like the Shiny dashboard, uh, different ways of plotting, different uh, forms of, of user interface layout, uh, the left pane versus right pane concepts, et cetera. And we'll get into some bootstrapping later on in the, in the uh, book. Uh, that'll be another way that we can exercise these extensions. All right. So right off the bat, we'll talk about inputs. Now, inputs are just what they say. They are an input from the user's browser and a call to the server. We have uh, four different options here for inputs. There's a slider input, a select input, text input, and then a numeric input. What I wanted to highlight within these four points is the fact that they all have a suffix of input. And so therefore it makes it easy to write some of these particular methods or these functions within your Shiny script and always remember that, oh, that's an input. I'm going to have a complementary, uh, either reactive call, some kind of a, a plotting service uh, that will render whatever input I'm asking the user to provide me. Throughout the future chapters, this will be a relationship of input and output. This is a good time to establish that exchange. Okay. The next section is called common structure. All input functions follow similar structure. For example, all of our various functional calls will require an input ID. Now this input ID is very specific and it's unique to that function. So as we're developing, we're writing, we're creating our content, this placeholder, uh, this input ID is going to be a reference between the UI and the server itself. It is a requirement we are uh, we are required to put this in here, but that's mainly because of the uh, document object model, the DOM itself and how it structures its HTML output when we render our Shiny app. Uh, this is a unique name assigned at the input object. Input ID has two constraints. The first one is it must be a single string or a simple string that contains only letters, numbers, and underscores. You can't use any special characters within this context because that special character may uh, compromise the uh, uh, language of HTML uh, or, or HTTP calls back and forth. You may uh, let, just use an app or sand as an example, uh, the and symbol. In an ASCII character form, it has one format. When it renders into an HTML output, that ampersand has a different uh, use case. And so therefore it will, it will bug out your code. There are, uh, error handlers within Shiny that will warn you that that's not, uh, that's not a uh, correct format, and we'll call those linters, but um, that may be a different subject for, for another time. Uh, and then it must be unique. Each one of these different handlers that you put or, or uh, functions that you put in your Shiny app, they must be unique to that one service. Uh, if you compromise it twice or, or name something the same thing twice, you're gonna have a, a conflict on the output of the HTML. Uh, it's gonna to try to reference two different points and it'll, it'll create an error for you. It, more than likely the web page won't paint for you. Most input functions have a, a second argument called a label. Now, the label is what's going to be, uh, uh, the label is going to be what is, is written to the uh, HTML page itself. So it's going to be the, the code that the user would witness. So your difference between user ID and how the, the Rshiny uh, package manages this in compiling and outputting HTML versus a human readable label uh, that we can uh, uh, reference as well. The third option is the value, and this is the default, sorry, this allows a default value to be used if required. Uh, we're gonna see here in a second where we're, we have some slider values and there's a default value that we're, we're exercising within that. Uh, script. All right. The next topic is talking about free text. <clears throat> There's three types of free text that we can enter. There's a text input, a password input, and a text area input. The differences between these are the length of characters or the amount of information that we're expecting from our user. So a text input is usually just a one-line entry. 
Uh, a password input, I believe, is encrypted, but let me double check that before I, I make that claim. And then a text area input would be a free form entry window that could be of infinite size. So think of it as a, a box on your web browser where somebody's typing in a bunch of information. Okay. We do have a code snippet here where we're talking about the user interface. We are creating a fluid page. Uh, we'll talk more about what the term fluid page implies. It's not in this chapter. But we have our text input line, we have a label, excuse me, we have a ID, unique ID called name, and then a label, what's your name? We have a password input called password. And then again, what is your password? We're asking the user to input this text. And then the text area input would be just a larger box. Now, we do have three rows of acceptance in this point. So you, there is going to be a, a, a limit to the amount of information that we can put inside this cell. If you don't mind, I don't have the example of this in visual form, uh, nor did I create any of these uh, points within a, a Shiny app. So I'm going to go over to our book real quick. And let's highlight what that user interface looks like. Okay, I'm going to zoom in. This will affect my other browser too. But So what we're seeing with this particular code snippet is what is your name? That's going to be the text displayed on the browser, the UI. And we have this freeform text entry, this box, this cell. Okay. There's another, what is your password? And again, it's going to be, uh, I believe this in, uh, shows as characters when you type it in. So it masks the input uh, similar to any other browser uh, password entry. It's not gonna be viewed. And then finally this three cell pane and you notice at the very bottom, and it's ever so slightly, let me see if I can zoom in a little closer. This is only a thumbnail. So um, what I'm wanting to highlight is these two points here where you have the, the diagonal lines. That is often a representation that says you can expand that cell as required on your browser. Um, we have to keep in mind that sometimes users are interacting with our service on a laptop computer, a desktop computer, a mobile device, a cell phone, et cetera. So this is a dynamic method of being able to expand and contract that cell entry. Let's go back out here. Going back to the presentation. We can also use validate. Validate is a, a additional argument that can be used for these text entries. Uh, I use the term mask within that language in a database form. We can enforce a format let's just use like a cell phone or a, a, just a, a phone number entry. We know that there's, uh, based on the locale of your, your uh, country, there's a format to that, that phone number entry. And we can, we can enforce that mask as a format of, of text entry. And if it's incorrect, it will error out and say, no, that's not correct. We need a different, different format. So the word validate or the function validate allows us Note the above code snippet has both a label, the first part, and the text that will be displayed to the HTML browser. I'm being particular here, and you see that I'm repeating myself multiple times. At this stage of learning or at this stage of the book, it's important to establish what these terms are implying as we continue on into advanced topics. This service or this uh, language, this lexicon will be vernacular, will be called upon multiple times over. So I'm hoping that I'm building this mental picture for you, the relationship between this UI and server, the relationship between inputs and outputs, et cetera. All right. Any questions so far? Does anybody have any detail that they would like to offer? No? Okay. The next option that we have is called numeric inputs. Now, numeric inputs, again, I made the reference to a... a uh, phone number uh, that could be a potential numeric input. Uh, we have numeric input as an option, slider input, and then we have slider input that we offer a range to. This next code snippet will provide us those options. So the first one is just a numeric input. We're calling the label, or sorry, the unique ID as num. The label is number one, and then the value from minimum and maximum of the range of that slider. The slider number two, again, is using a, a unique ID as num two, label is number two, and then the value is 
going to start at 50, but the range that we're applying to it would be from zero to 100. The third option that we have is a particular range, excuse me, let me go back because I, I realized I made a mistake with that statement. In the second example we have here, the overall slider is going to be from the values zero to 100. And by default, when the HTML page generates on the user's browser, uh, the slider will be set at the value of 50. So it'll be at the midpoint, halfway point. And then the, the third option we have here is going to provide a range. Again, the unique ID is RNG range. The label that we are applying is called range. And then the value is going to be between zero and 100. But because it's this selection range, it's going to start out between the values of 10 and 20. Okay. Again, Lucy, to our benefit, because I did not render these as thumbnails, nor do I have the user interface, I'm just switching back over to our book to show you what these imply. So the, the number value that we're dropping here it has an incrementer and decrementer. These are just automatically applied because we selected that numeric input option. The uh, number. Please. Go ahead, okay, sir. Please let me take you back. I think yeah. uh, there is where you said uh, text inputs. And I, I want to know the main difference between the text inputs and also verbatim text inputs. You want to know the difference between the textual values and the numeric values? And the verbatim text inputs. I think there is also a. So a textual input is going to be expressing some level of string or character entry as a, as a classification of that variable. Whereas a numeric value is going to be like an integer, a float, a double, something of that nature. So the, the underlying relationship of how that information is managed will be the uh, classification or the structure of that variable. So the, the differences between these two text box, does that answer your question? Yes. They look very similar. That is correct. They do look very similar. And let me go back to the chap, or sorry, to the photos here. So we're seeing these, these uh, I don't know, freeform text entries in our user interface or in our Shiny app script. We are specifying these as a text entry. So therefore, by default, it's going to use that as a character expectation. Whereas if we use a numeric input, whether it be the incrementer, decrementer, increasing and decreasing the range of our value, the slider itself, or the range value, and that's what I was trying to specify was this double point where we're providing a range that you can select from. This is going to be expecting some level of integer, double, float, something of numeric entry. That's a great question though. Um, Ren, I also have a question, but also yeah. uh, we had, I think last week we, 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 we covered the verbatim uh, text inputs, uh, it was output, sorry. Yes, oh, sorry, my apologies. For last week it was output. Yeah, we were providing right. like a summary table. Yeah, okay, just like a box with a summary. Okay, so I have a question in this mm -hmm. that, um, please go back to the course notes, sorry, the book itself. That's okay, you bet. Yeah, uh, just below, there's the link that was shared with an example of how the slider input, yes, this, if you can click on it, I sure want can. to ask a question, yeah. You bet. So I was trying to do these examples mm -hmm. on my own. Just go below. Yep. Uh, this are called, um, yeah, these, this uh, for these animates. points right here. Yes, yes, this for animates. Uh, so the next one, the, yes, that's, uh, sorry, <laughs> just uh, go up. I am so sorry. That's okay. Yes, uh, just the slider input, where, where your cursor is, exactly that. The slider the input animation. Custom. Yeah, yes, 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 that. So I, I did run this and I realized that because of the step, uh, this value is equals to one and step is equals to 10. So we're looking at the, the range between one to 2000. And yeah. uh, so if you look at this, so it is providing like an animate, like what you see from Gigi Animate. But I realized when you're looking into like, if you're going in steps of 10, it is quite slow. 
like it takes a minute before it goes to the next yeah like that so I, I was wondering if there's an there's a, there's a way of increasing speed but then when i increased the steps instead of looking into like steps of 10 so from 1 10 like that so mm -hmm. i increased to 100 and i realized that it's no it's fast no 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 oh, it's it moves fast. too like, fast then no, it was not too fast, but it was fast as compared to when you're moving in steps of 10 and like when you're moving in steps of 100, yeah. So the, the, the animation, I haven't used this script before, but I'm assuming that it is similar to like a vector animation type scenario. Uh, the changing of the speed or the changing of the interval jump is going to increase or decrease the frame rate of that animation, the sequence of how fast it, it processes through the values, correct? So in, in HTML animation, if you don't mind, I'll just expand on that subject for a brief moment. I use the term frame rate. Uh, in most cases, the human eye uh, receives a 60 hertz input. Um, it's going to be the, I think it's 24. Is it 24 is the frame rate. There's a value that the human eye doesn't really notice animation, excuse me, doesn't notice the frame changing. And if you if you increase that frequency, then it starts to look like it's animated. But in truth, all it's doing is refreshing itself faster and faster. That frame rate scenario is actually what these interval values are versus the stepped sequence of how quickly we iterate through zero to whatever infinite number we provide. Does that make sense? The, the length of time that the animation is running in addition to the speed or how quick we chug through all of those values. There's a, there's a distinct difference in discussion of animation. I can run this script and maybe get back with you and, and uh, expand a little bit more on the relationship of these two values. Okay. Yes, yes, please, thank you. Okay. Uh, this is a good comment. And, and there's two ways that you can manage uh, this format of animation. What we're seeing here is just shiny code application of this service. But in truth, if we jump out into the browser's language, which would usually be JavaScript, uh, cascading style sheet, or some kind of HTML, you're not going to get animation from an HTML language. It's going to be either CSS or JavaScript. And there's two ways that we can manipulate those. But that'll be a more advanced topic in relation to how that information is managed by the Shiny compiler and then ingested to generate our HTML output. Good question, though. Okay. Thank you. You bet. You bet. Um, and to your your benefit, uh, Lucy, let me make sure I'm on the right spot here. There we go. Let's move this back over. Um, this same web link, uh, I, I went to the browser and then used the markdown uh, uh, title of that page. That's why it's a little bit different, but it is the same link. So when we post this uh, in our GitHub repo and everyone's accessing, uh, accessing it, it'll be the same link that's in our text as well. Okay. Um, all right, so the next topic is gonna be dates. Now dates can be a little bit funny and I'm putting that opinion on the, the subject of dates because it depends. It really depends on what calendar you're using. Um, are you implying a Gregorian calendar? Are you um, uh, implying, I can't remember the other one, uh, Julian calendar, uh, what date range are we using? And there's infinite uh, possibilities of how this information is managed. Um, and one of the first thoughts that I had in mind when I read this chapter or this section of the chapter was Luberdate. Uh, Luberdate is, a, and is, amaz it is an amazing package that is able to manipulate a lot of this information. When we are using either date input or date range input, this is always going to default to a US-based format of calendar. That's important to recognize if we are generating an international form, and I'm even being careful with the term international because it's just saying that by default it's US, so if we put it in another country's locale, we just need to modify some of the expectations of how this shiny service is using those date formats. As an example, you can change the format, the language, and the week start to respect those other formats of calendar. Does that help everyone? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe US base is Gregorian, whereas uh, 
other countries will use a more Julian date format of, of uh, start uh, uh, week starts. So keeping that in mind, being respectful to the to the person that is rendering or, or reading our content, the app that we're generating, we want to also ensure that they're following the proper format. So their date range is, is uh, specific. And there's alternate ways within the browser to confirm what location they're at. Uh, and we can even make a switch call in between those different locales as well. All right. Um, going back to the book as an example, and I'm sorry that I keep going back and forth. The reason I did this is I did not want to ingest a bunch of thumbnails, nor did I create a shiny app that I continually went through. So I'm just referring back and forth to the book's examples. The first input we have is just date input. And the format that we have is uh, year, month, and then day. If we want to change that to be month, day, year, uh, day, month, year, however, however we want to modify that, we can put commas instead of dashes. Uh, that's where the masking concept comes in. And then this date in, uh, range input gives us a to and then from, or from and to, uh, gives us a two point entry. Uh, let's keep going, limited choices. I found this very specific or I found it uh, rewarding to comprehend what's going on here. When we give limited choices, what we're doing is telling the user, here's your options, you select from one of these options. Now it can be very small, it can be extremely large. The point is that we are only providing him this information so that it is not free form text. And that's the distinction I want to establish between the two is we're providing the user a selection versus letting the person enter whatever content they want. So we have two options, the select input, which would be similar to above, and then the radio button option as well. I found that this section flip-flopped between the two. So let me clarify as I'm going through these. The first is we are creating a, uh, a tibble, a, data frame, a, a vector of, of information with dog, cat, mouse, bird, other, and I hate animals. So just know that we have a variable called animals. The UI is having a select input either state, and then what's your favorite state, and then we have this option of selecting different state names. What I found specific to that statement is the fact that we are an international book club, uh, and that not everybody has states. Uh, you may have a different format of, of uh, geographic delineation uh, or government delineation. The other is the radio button option. And in this case, we're using that variable we had, sorry, we're creating the unique ideas animal. Uh, we're putting the text as what is your favorite animal? And then we're passing that previous uh, list into our function so that we're selecting dog, cat, mouse, bird, or other. The radio buttons are an excellent excellent for short lists. They are going to take up space on your user's browser. So depending on how many options you wanna provide them, it could extend quite lengthy. Uh, so keep that in mind. You wanna uh, use this option when they're a little bit shorter. You don't wanna use, uh, you don't wanna have the user scrolling uh, to find their selection of option. They're also great when used with choice names and choice values as arguments. Choice names determines what is shown to the user or example. Uh, the example in the book was using emojis uh, as, as a uh, example. And then the choice values determines what to return to the server function. So what did I provide them? And then what are they choosing to send back to the server? Dropdowns are created with select input. And they take up the same amount of UI space regardless of the length of the list. So you could have... 10 names, you could have 50 names, you could have a thousand points in that select input range, that drop down menu. It allows the user to kind of uh, scroll through the options. Sometimes you'll see this on uh, data entry points from a browser's perspective. Okay. Note, if you drop down the select uh, selection is lengthy, you may want to use a server side select input option. Now, this is important, but it's more of an advanced topic. And so I, I didn't want to give it so much focus, but I wanted to explain what was going on here. You can produce a list similar to the variable that we have here, 
right? Now, this is going to render in your browser. And if we are managing the internet network timing of generator ren generating or rendering your HTML page, it has, to, it has to consume all of this data and then populate it into a range. That's not very efficient because we're, we're expecting a lot of network calls and a lot of information flow between the server and the browser. We don't know where the browser's at or the, the uh, relationship of their internet connection. So this could take a long time to render, which would be a poor UI call. Instead, what we could use is a server side statement so that it only exercises that range when we select that cell. The cost of exchange between the network, the user's browser and the server is only incurred when we're, we're uh, entered, while we are interacting with that select input box. Does that make sense to everyone? The difference between the two of having it populated in the UI of, of automatically rendering. Uh, another relationship that I could, I could uh, use as an example would be um, large thumbnails on a web page are usually often considered poor coding uh, because it takes a long time to download that four to six megabyte you know, thumbnail uh, just to paint it on your screen. What you could do is change it from a JPEG or a bitmap into a PNG uh, post networks graphic. And so you're gonna reduce, it's a lossless conversion, but you're, you're maintaining the same image. It just doesn't have as much information. So therefore you're, you're optimizing the network call. That's kind of what this paragraph is talking about. Uh, there's no method for multiple selections uh, with radio buttons. It's just a one choice option and that's it. Uh, a radio button is a circular uh, dot on the screen and then by mousing over or selecting it, uh, it'll populate it. That radio button option doesn't provide us a means to multi-select. Instead, what we're going to use is check boxes. Now we can use checkbox group inputs or just checks checkbox input. There's a there's a key uh, to the use of checks checkbox versus radio buttons. They look slightly different. The UI looks slightly different, uh, and then they the relationship of how they're managed on the server side is also different as well. So let me go back to the textbook real quick and show you what I'm referring to. So this first entry of state, what is your favorite state? This is that multi-select, excuse me, drop down menu selection. So by, uh, by uh, exercise, I keep using the word exercise, by pressing on the down arrow, it would expand that option and then you could scroll up and down in between the selection. This is called a radio button. It's kind of a shadowed circle. Uh, many, many, many languages utilize this format of radio, this uh, icon. When you select that, it'll put a dot inside that radio button. If we scroll down and look at the checkbox, uh, yes. So this is more of a squared shadow format. And this does provide us the option of multi-select. So do you, uh, depending on what you're expecting to do with your user interface, uh, the interaction between the user, uh, do we want a single selection or do we want a multi-selection? Uh, we'll see these very often if we go to a Shiny Apps uh, IO example, you'll see users authoring Shiny Apps that uh, manipulate you, uh, you provide the selection of a plot example. And what ranges do you want in this plot? Uh, what uh, calculations, what mathematical statistical calculations do you want to choose? And by selecting or multi-selecting these options, the output is going to, uh, sorry, the server will receive those inputs, generate the output code, and then populate that uh, plotted uh, placeholder on the browser. So I'm kind of going a little bit too advanced in that statement because we haven't got to that section of the chapter yet. Um, at this point, we're just talking about what they look like or what the call would look like. Back to our presentation. I did want to highlight the checkbox input does have a default value and the two lines look nearly identical. The only difference here is that we incorporate a value equals true what this does on the user's browser will automatically select that by default. 
and then it, uh, we allow the user to change it if required. All right, file uploads, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with. We have an entire chapter dedicated to this. <clears throat> I just wanted to provide the example of what it would imply. So we can make a file input call and then label it as upload. And then the value that would be populated during rendering would be null or nothing. Be very, very, very careful here. You do not, do not, from a security perspective, want users to ingest or put files onto your server. It is a very, very simple and easy way for a person to hack your application. It's easy for the person to hack that server. So by default, I would use these with very, very much caution. In chapter nine, we will cover uploads and downloads and they will talk very, very heavily about uh, like expectations of file upload, uh, what, what file extensions we're expecting to receive. Even within the file extension, the format of the file must be a certain manner. So you, you, can, you can block a lot of security vulnerabilities with that chapter nine section. I won't say it'll be exhaustive. There's many, many, many other ways that you can manage this, but um, I would just put to the all users that may be watching this video, be very careful when you're providing options to upload files to a server. It's a very quick way to ingest malware. It's almost like leaving the, the door open to your uh, home while you go on vacation and expecting that everyone's uh, never going to steal anything from your home. Uh, it's, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So don't even give them the option. I would say don't even have a door to your home. I'm joking. That's, a, that's me being funny. All right. Now, action buttons. Um, for me, during the initial comprehension or understanding of using Shiny or browser interaction, uh, I always find action buttons to be very rewarding, and they give a very easy way to provide an exchange of expectation, right? Uh, testing. I want to put an action button here. Let me click on that action button and see what output is, uh, is conveyed. These are great to not only provide some level of, hey, that's kind of cool. I got you know this little Easter egg. If I click this icon and this other option pops up, et cetera, these action buttons provide some navigation points. The two examples we have is, are either an action button or an action link. Um, again, we've got the label of click and then click me. Uh, we also have drink, drink me, and then we use the icon of cocktail. Now, we didn't talk about icons just yet. There was a reference in the checkbox up above or the radio button topic up above. I didn't have that thumbnail, but there was a reference to icons. Um, this is a way that you can place um, their emojis, I guess, or, or uh, there's a, there's a uh, it's not windings, that's a, that's a Microsoft thing. There's a term for those, those uh, uh, emojis. If you have an Android phone or, a, or an Apple phone, that's how your different keyboards, you can switch to that emoji keyboard. And that's what we're referencing here is this icon library. Action buttons and action links are most often paired with an observe event or an event reactive. So we're, when you press this button, I'm expecting the browser to do something. I want it to recalculate my plot. I want it to navigate to another uh, uh, web page. I want it to uh, submit my text entry to the server. Right? I'm done filling out my form. I hit the submit button and it sends that data to the server. There's an expectation of either an observe event or an event reactive when we incorporate action buttons. Uh, let's see, these will be on the server side function. Uh, they'll be covered in chapter three. A more advanced topic on this subject of action buttons is the class of action button. Now, we're, I'm being critical to the author in this section talking about class of buttons. What we're referring to in the word class is a CSS variable. So there's a default within Shiny that when I call on this class, I have additional options that I didn't even realize were there. Examples would be button primary, button success, button info, button warning, and button danger. If the team would like, I would be more than happy to try and generate some code 
that would exercise some of these different formats and then what tag they're referencing or what class they're referencing in our Shiny CSS. This will be topics later on in the chapter, but the reason I'm being critical to the, to the author is we're pulling in some very advanced topics at this stage of learning. Um, just know that an action button looks like this. And every one of us have probably used them in the past, but we don't realize what they are yet. These action buttons, when you press them, will have some other service and we can label them, we can change them, we can make them large, small, span across the entire page, et cetera. You can also change the size of the button. We have button large, button small, and then button extra small. If you uh, see, finally, you can make buttons span the entire width of an element that are embedded within, within using button block. And what that'll do is expand across your entire browser. Uh, those are specific or dynamic to the rendering of that HTML page. My comment earlier was you may be using this on a laptop, you may be using it on a desktop with a really big screen. It could be on a phone. That dynamic reference, HTML5 reference, that span block is going to be the width of the user's browser, whatever format they're using. The class argument is, again, referencing that HTML and CSS. Uh, there is a hyperlink here. Again, Lucy, for the purposes of our cohort three, uh, this link is the same that's in the text. I just used the title of where the, the uh, pointer was taking us. So this is a bootstrap reference. In this case, it's uh, version 336 documentation for bootstrap. Uh, I want to say, go back to our chapters real quick. Sorry, team, I just wanted to confirm and uh, make you look forward to cascading style sheets. Where is that at? It's the look and feel of our browser, or look and feel. I think it's chapter six, layout themes in HTML, I think is when we make references to cascading style sheets and bootstrapping, et cetera. So it is forthcoming why I'm being critical to the author. Um, let's make sure I'm okay. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes, right? Yes. About 13 minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Am I covering the topics, uh, enough to comprehend what's going on? Uh, yes, so you are. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Next slide is going to talk about outputs. So this entire topic for the last 30 minutes, 35 minutes has been about input options. Now we're going to talk about those outputs. Uh, Lucy, you had made a reference to that slider uh, option and then the output range. Uh, this is where inputs and outputs, don't think of them technically as being the user and the server. Um, they can both be in, in both places, but it's how you reference them. It's, it's the code that would imply the, the, the linking between the two. Outputs in the UI create placeholders that are later filled by server functions. So I've got this output field. I've got this box. I have an action button. When I select the action button, my server populates that output field on my user's browser. The reason this is a little confusing is the terminology that we imply to them. It's an output field. So for me at least, and again, I don't want to uh, modify your opinion, for me, the word output means it's coming from the server. But no, that's not true. The output field is a placeholder on my user's browser that I'm expecting output from my server to populate, if that makes sense. It's not an input field where I'm taking data from my UI and sending it to the server. I'm uh, creating a placeholder on my browser, expecting it to be populated from server calls. Outputs take unique IDs, as in the first argument. That's no different than our input text fields that we had before, or input fields we had before. Everything has to have a unique ID. In the example the author provided us, it says the UI specification creates an output ID called plot. To access this plot, to access this, this unique ID on the server's end, it would take the format of output dollar sign plot. <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm being a little careful here because this is one of the more confusing aspects of writing in shiny format. The relationship of a unique ID and then it's referencing or it's 
exercise in the server's end making reference to that same point. They always must match. But the, the, the format when we're writing the script is ever so slightly different that it can create a little bit of confusion. Always remember that if you see this dollar sign and then some name, right? Output is just a function call. It's saying access this output variable that my user interface has and then grab the variable plot to populate it. Right? I'm acting as the server in that respect. Each output function on the front end is coupled with a render function on the back end. So front end is the placeholder. It's just a box or a text entry, some kind of object on the browser. And then we're populating that object with data from the server. So that's where that render function comes in. Note, this is a key concept and we'll continually come back to it, uh, this concept again and, and again throughout this first entry and in additional chapters later in the text. What I'm hoping to do, similar to the very beginning of our conversation with this chapter, is re, uh, establishing in your mind's eye the relationship between UI and server, the relationship between inputs and outputs, the relationship between how the UI is, is providing a placeholder versus what the server is making to call that. These are all very critical thoughts to have in development of Shiny apps, and I would never expect anybody to get it right off the bat. Um, if you do, that's awesome. I very much support you, uh, but it's it's been quite a while and I'm still wrangling with writing a shiny script and then trying to debug or troubleshoot it on the web browser side in more of a web dev uh, format of, of debugging. And I'm just wrapping my head around when I render the shiny app and then this is my output call, how do these react or how do these relate to each other? And it's just a, it's a protocol translation. It's a language translation. There are three main types of outputs corresponding to the three things you will usually include in a report, such as a text, tables, or plots. For a render output text, output regular text with text output, and fixed code in console output with verbatim text output. There's a comment here that says the UI text output text coupled with the server side language of output dollar sign text, and then that is render text. This format of server side language, where I'm making a function call of render text, this is grab the variable, go through this particular process of rendering, and then put it into this placeholder output text from the server populating our uh, text output placeholder on the user input, sorry, text output on the user's browser. We have a statement here where it talks about curly brackets. Curly brackets are used to surround multiple lines of a render code. You should do this as little computation in your render function as possible. These are extremely costly. When you make render calls between the server and the user's browser, you are expecting that a person is on a gigabit speed network and that they have you know 16 core cpus with you know great awesome graphics cards expectation and it's never 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 the case you always want to take into account the weakest link of person that would be generating this output rendering anything is automatically going to be a taxing exchange whether it be on the network calls the server side or the user's browser and trying to uh, render it on the screen, the document object model rendering it on the screen. So you want to use as limited amount of logic as possible. And then possibly if you are going to be generating a lot of code like this, we're going to talk about optimizing it by using other services within the Shiny ecosystem. Okay. Note there are two render functions which behave slightly different between the two. There's the render text option and the render print option. Render text combines the result in a single string and is usually paired with a text output call. The render print option is similar to when you're in the R console and it's usually paired with a verbatim text output. The equivalent in a base R language would be uh, either the cat call or the print option. Cat stands for concatenate. It's just reading a text cell and then putting it on standout, putting it into your terminal. 
uh, and then the print option would be, um, I presume that it's putting it into the terminal itself. These are similar to each other. All right, tables. There are two options for displaying data tables. We have table output and render table. And then we also have data table output and render data table. The differences between the two and why I'm making a, a important reference between is they're ever so slightly different. If you notice the format is table and then output, and then here it's called render and then the table. To me in reading this, they're almost inverted with each other. And that's why I, for me personally, I always find the relationship of reading these a little difficult. You have to pause and think of what exactly these, these two points are doing. The difference is data, uh, sorry, table output is rendering a static table of data showing all the data at once. These are very useful for fixed summaries, small and fixed summaries. If we use data table output, however, now it's more dynamic. We're showing both a fixed number of rows along with controls to change which rows are visible. There's a reference to a second rendering engine, uh, interactive data tables uh, by Grant, uh, Gret. I think that's supposed to be Gret. Greg, I think that's Greg, sorry. That T is supposed to be a G. Uh, Greg Lynn, uh, this person wrote a second package that we can leverage in working with data table output uh, to make it more aesthetically pleasing to the browser. Uh, and the book did a really good job with this example. Let me show what I was getting at here. So the difference between just providing textual tabular data to the browser uh, versus having the option of drop down menus of how many rows I want to select, maybe possibly searching inside that, uh, using different features at the bottom. So like search terms, I could type in you know a range down here and then have it sort the uh, data for us. Uh, this second format of render data table is what is calling that the, the word render is the package, the link that they're providing us here. Okay, almost done. Give me just two more seconds. Um, plots, plots are base R oriented. So we're not calling on ggplot necessarily here. Um, I wanna be careful that I'm making the distinction between the two. This is a base function of plotting. Um, if you want more pleasing output, then you can render ggplot, uh, which gives you a infinite amount of options in uh, rendering a very pleasing graph. But for the purposes of this text, for the purposes of this discussion, the output plot and then render plot is just taking the data and then putting it to our output screen. Again, this placeholder. Uh, I'm going to show you a brief example here. I'll zoom in here. So this is a slider bin okay, that is changing. And then this is my render plot output. And as I change my slider, you can see that the uh, binning of our values change. All right. Nope. Here we go. Uh, by default, uh, the recommendation is to make these 96 pixels uh, in size. Uh, you can modify this as needed. 96 is going to be similar to what uh, our studio uses as a base uh, resolution for generating their graphical objects. You can also change the plot output because they are specific. These are interactive. You can do things with them. So by adding additional logic to them, as an example, click, double click, or hover. Um, maybe you want a specific... Uh, uh, I don't know, mapping feature, right? So you have this graphical object. When I hover over that map, tell me the uh, uh, naming convention uh, or maybe the GIS data points, latitude and longitude of that, of that entry. I'm being specific to mapping, but it could be of any value there. Uh, downloads are the next option. Um, downloads will be covered in chapter nine, similar to our upload compliment I had earlier, uh, use caution with security, et cetera. And the download option, what format do you want to download in? Is it a CSV file? Is it a PDF, right? Um, RDS file, what, what, are you, what are you providing the user with this download option? 
what are you rendering for them? All right, that concludes this particular topic. Um, are there any questions? I went over this very, very briefly. Thank you so much, Ren. I, I actually have a question. But yes, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure if it is a shiny question, but it is more <laughs> the digital you have mentioned about changing the resolution. I have had a problem where whenever I save the plots, they're not that clear. And I didn't know that you can actually change it using the REST argument. Is that correct? That I use the REST argument? Uh, res stands for resolution. Yes, you can change the resolution of the rendered output. And what you're doing in that respect would be uh, similar to, I don't know, like a microscope and you're tuning the focusing knob, right? So you're, 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 you're placing it in the best optimal form for your current window of opportunity. Um, because HTML or specifically HTML5 is dynamic, um, you want to take that into consideration. So there are other options. If you statically apply a resolution value, it may actually look horrible or not even render properly on a mobile device uh, with a different resolution option. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, be careful with, I'm not telling you to be careful, I'm telling you to keep in mind that by changing these resolution values, you may be uh, compromising the normal data structure of how that graphical object is rendering it on the browser. And I can definitely sidebar on that subject. I deal with this quite often in relation to imagery and especially web centric imagery. Surprisingly, it is uh, uh, by providing a width and height resolution and then rendering it on a browser, you realize, wow, that's really, really big or really, really small. Um, you can you can modify those as needed. Awesome, thank you. you bet. I, think I have a question on this. Uh, yes. When you were talking about uh, the download, can yes. we provide a uh, multiple option like to download CSV or mm -hmm. as an Excel, Excel file? Can I provide a multiple uh, argument in which we can download in any format? Correct. Well, even even better yet, you could even select like like create a radio button or a, a checkbox option so that when the uh, when the server receives that selection, it calls on the that particular format of rendered output. That's another way that you could manage that multi selection concept. Okay, thank you. No. I would uh, not because I'm telling you to be cautious or or, or, or trying to guide you in uh, proper or best practices. Um, anything that you deal with in Excel will automatically require some other rendered package. Excel is a proprietary binary format of output. Um, X, SLXX is technically an XML format, but the point being is that it's unique to a Microsoft environment. Um, our studio being open source is going to require an additional package to populate or generate output that binary form or proprietary form of output. Um, the way I would I would mitigate that comment would be go with CSV file instead, uh, comma separated vari variable or, or a tabular separated variable file. And the reason I'm making that statement is because it'll accept it in Excel and it'll accept it in text, it'll accept it in any other operating systems or, or uh, program. Uh, it's more commonplace across multiple operating systems. Excel is very specific to Microsoft only, so, or Microsoft products anyway. I should have expressed, and Lucy, if you don't mind me just making one last statement before I close out. I'm agnostic to operating systems. I run all three primary Linux, Mac, and Windows operating systems. I'm very fluent in all of the various forms and types of generating output. Um, if I make a statement towards best practices or I would recommend going this route, do not take it as I'm telling you, you have to go this route. I'm not. I'm only exercising the uh, learned points of I've already went down this rabbit hole and it doesn't quite work that well, or it actually really makes things difficult to manage. So don't take my comments as being, you have to do it this way. I am more supportive to any user's expectation or wishes as needed.
Okay, I uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for a wonderful discussion. It was quite insightful. I believe we have learned a lot regarding just the basic UI. And we can't wait to learn more about the basic server next week.